So, Paul, 1949, you're elected as the youngest uh, member of parliament in Canadian history. How old were you then? I was 25, and I'm celebrating the 70th anniversary in just a few days. Amazing. What made you think you could do that at 25? Um, not being very realistic. <laughs> I, uh, I guess in those days you think you can do anything, and uh, so I, I tried uh, to do the impossible, <clears throat> and it worked. But, uh, and also I learned the first lesson of politics, which was that uh, backbenchers don't influence policy on anything very much, let alone uh, monetary and uh, fiscal policies. So uh, I had a lot to learn, but uh, I was in the House and it was a start and uh, it was basically a miracle, I think, uh, that I got in because the uh, odds were 15 to 1 against me on election day in the local pub, but uh, it happened. It's amazing. And you're saying like backbenchers couldn't make adjustments. So you fixed that too, because eight years later you were elected as the youngest cabinet, you were chosen as the youngest cabinet member. In case. Yes, I was uh, the last of the uh, San Ramon appointees, <clears throat> which uh, makes uh, me, uh, gives me the dubious honor of being the dean of the Privy Council, the senior member of the Privy Council, just ahead of uh, Prince Philip. But um, that and uh, a lot of money will buy you a cigar, you know. <laughs> so you beat the odds, you get you get into the house, you beat the odds, you make it to cabinet, and now you have to unify the uh, Canadian Armed Forces, which was not terribly popular at the time. That's an understatement. It was a real war, and uh, every other minister since the uh, Second World War had said that it should be done. It was it was almost impossible again. And what I learned was that is, it is difficult, bordering on impossible, to change anything of substance in government. Because the system, the built-in uh, system of, of civil servants and so on, is so rigid and so strong that they really think they run the country and they own the country. And once they get an idea, they won't change it if they can possibly avoid it. So uh, what we did was, uh, was really another miracle. Defense uh, Secretary Robert McNamara said, Hellier's done what every Minister of Defense wanted to do, but didn't have the guts to do. Why was it important to do? Because the, the uh, system was so inefficient. The three services acted independently. They were not working as a team. Even during the war, they were not working as a team. And worst of all, it was that um, the three services were planning for three different kinds of wars when I took over as minister. So this doesn't make any sense. You've got to have some kind of a consensus because you can't plan, buy equipment, and do all that sort of thing uh, and go in three different directions at the same time. So 14 years ago, you do find yourself presented with some pretty remarkable information uh, that was new to you. Can you Correct. talk about that? Well, yes, I really uh, was not into the uh, ET and the UFO file at all. When I was minister, I had uh, sighting reports. And uh, on reflection, they were about the same as in other countries' experience. About 80% of the uh, sightings reports were uh, natural phenomena. And uh, about 15 or 20% were unidentified, so they fit the, the definition of unidentified flying objects. But I was too busy um, unifying the armed forces to spend much time on that file. <clears throat> Bob McNamara used to say he would tell me anything I wanted to know, but I didn't know the right questions to ask. So uh, I finished uh, that portfolio and got on my way uh, without ever knowing a lot of the things that were going on. I don't know how much he would have told me, probably quite a bit at the time because we were quite close. But uh, I wound up uh, post-war with uh, this file so far from my mind that it was a way down the list. And it was only, uh, well, again, I don't, I'm don't, i not sure it was happenstance, but uh, I seemed to be picked to uh, just carry the banner for uh, 
former public officials in the G8 and say that uh, the UFOs are as real as airplanes flying overhead. And I had to assure my bride uh, of a week uh, from the day that I went public that it was a one-off and <clears throat> so on. And uh, she said, well, if you think it's important, um, go ahead. Because I was afraid that the United States Air Force, who have a habit of uh, shooting first and asking questions after, would start shooting at the visitors from other planets and other star systems and uh, maybe get us into a galactic war at some stage. And uh, the way things are working out uh, over the last 14 years, I, my concern was, I think, uh, very real and um, just as concerned today as I was then. When you were originally given this information, how did you go about confirming it? Because you've <clears throat> been a public service and a public, public service and servant and a politician for so long, um, you're going to want to confirm this information. How did you go about doing that? I don't want you to portray any confidences, but just. Well, I, <clears throat> first of all, I got, um, I was, I was uh, encouraged to go into this field by a young man by the name of Pierre Junot young bilingual uh, chap from uh, Ottawa who started sending me stuff on the, uh, on the subject and I told him honestly I didn't have time to read about it or worry about it. He said, well, put it on the shelf for a rainy day. He encouraged me to watch an ABC uh, special of uh, two hours put together by Peter Jennings, the late Peter Jennings of Ottawa. And so I did watch it and uh, were former Air Force pilots, U.S. Air Force pilots, and former uh, civilian pilots, air traffic controllers, policemen, all said they had seen UFOs. And after it, I had to say to myself, well, why would they lie? I mean, they're not getting paid to lie, surely. Um, they must be telling the truth. But as it was sort of put in the back crevice of my mind. Well, then Pierre had sent me a, a book called The Day After Roswell, and uh, I said, that looks like a good read for my summer reading at the Rental Lodge, our little place in Muskoka. And so I took it. And I was about halfway through when uh, I was realizing that it was the real thing because I recognized the names of the generals of the airfields from my days in Ottawa. My uh, nephew came along and asked me what I was reading. I told him, he said, well, I'm a skeptic. I said, well, it's a free country, more or less, getting less all the time. Uh, so you can be a skeptic if you want to. So he went home, and uh, a couple of days later he called and said, uh, I called the general and told him what you were reading, and he said, every word's true but more and more. Where can I get a copy of the book? So I decided, I had already decided that it was, uh, it was true and that was the real thing. But hearing that the general had said so uh, was sounded like confirmation. But uh, before going public, I decided I should get it uh, from his lips personally. So I asked my nephew to, uh, to give him a heads up that I was to call and to get his number for me, which he did. So I called him. And before I could even say, hello, how are you? He said, every word is true and more. And then he spent 20 minutes talking about the more to the extent that he could without breaking his oath to, to a great an extent. And the most important thing he said was there have been face-to-face -face meetings between United States officials and visitors from other star systems, period. Why do you think he told you that? Um, I think he respected me and felt maybe that um, it was good that I should have that information. But it, it's also dangerous information. Well, of course, the whole knowing anything about what's going on is dangerous information if you start talking about it. But in any event, I was convinced that I had to speak out, and that's when I decided to uh, accept the, uh, the outstanding invitation from Victor Vigiani and Mike Bird to go to their exopolitics uh, conference at the uh, University of Toronto and say uh, that airplanes are as real as the uh, 
at least the UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. I felt uh, a lot of responsibility to humankind to get the discussion into the public uh, domain to the extent possible. And of course, I've been working at it for 13 years since with, uh, with some modest results, but uh, still only like a drop in the bucket compared to uh, what has to happen next. Do you ever regret it? It's a big decision. No, not at all, because uh, I think it was intended to be. I'm a believer, and I think that the, uh, the creator of the, uh, of the cosmos uh, said we need some more people out there uh, spreading the word, and uh, you're somebody who has the uh, ability to do that, and the training, and the credibility. And then if you look back over my career path, you can see that I almost was not appointed parliamentary secretary to defense, in which case I would never have wound up as minister of defense, in which case I wouldn't have had half the credibility that I have as a former minister of defense, because people expect me to tell the truth, and they expect me to know something, and to tell them what I know, and, uh, and give them the straight goods. So I think the whole thing uh, ties together in a very interesting and uh, very uh, thoughtful manner. And uh, I appreciate, actually, the opportunity, even though I know that uh, it has put my life uh, in the crosshairs of a couple of people that don't really appreciate what I'm saying. Are you concerned about repercussions? Well, you have to be concerned, but at the same time, I'm 95 going on 96 years old. I've had a good life. Um, I know what happens to people when they die, and I, I know that it's good, not bad. <laughs> and uh, so I'm not the least bit uh, concerned about uh, being bumped off, <laughs> saying the worst thing they can do to me is kill me, and, uh, and that would be a promotion in a way. So uh, <clears throat> say, say your piece and, uh, and accept the consequences, whatever they may uh, happen to be. For somebody starting beginning down this path, what is the single piece of evidence or the single event or the single document that you would suggest for someone to begin with, the most compelling thing that you've come across? Well, I think I would start them with Corso's book. And then after that, to, uh, to read uh, 10 or 20 of the other books by uh, ufologists, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, of course, and Paula Harris, and uh, Grant Cameron, and, uh, and uh, the whole list of of uh, people who have spent years and years checking the veracity of the, of the information which has been uh, made available. Yes. <clears throat> but uh, Kravis Walton, I, I was just saying, uh, I invited him to Las Vegas 12 years ago and spent hours uh, asking him questions. And at the end of the weekend, I was satisfied that he was telling the truth. And Jim Sparks, I spent a lot of time talking to him, and finally I was satisfied that uh, he was telling the truth. So those were two examples I put in my first book that mentioned this subject, Light at the End of the Tunnel. And uh, then in the meantime, I had been uh, in London, and uh, Nick Pope gave me a case to, uh, to follow up. And uh, the only reason was that it had gotten into the public domain somehow through the Brits, who had leaked it, uh, I don't know, probably accidentally. And so he gave me that. And uh, so uh, I was in Washington for the National Prayer Breakfast, and I, was, uh, uh, I phoned uh, Colonel Halt, Charles Halt, and, uh, and asked if uh, he would see me. And he said, I don't normally talk about these things, but if Nick Pope recommended you, I'll see you. So he did, and I got a, after the show was over down there, I got a car and <clears throat> drove down to his gated community that he was in charge of. And he told me in two hours, in answer to my general questions, all about the Brentwater water, Brent Waters case, Brentwater Forest case, and, and it was absolutely authentic. And I can recognize a hard-nosed colonel when I see one. 
And they said, this is not the kind of guy that's going to put a, make up a story for you. This is somebody that's going to tell you the truth. And the biggest truth of the whole thing was the second or third uh, incident of sighting was when uh, his commanding officer said, well, well, you go out and deal with this situation. And he said he marched out the door saying, I'm going to put an end to this nonsense once and for all. And of course, just instead of doing that, he wound up having his life changed forever. And uh, that's the kind of evidence that, uh, you know, I would say is 100%. You just can't beat it at all. So with what you know and what's happened over the last two years in terms of these uh, admissions by the U.S. military and uh, other leaks and information dumps, it really does feel like we are rounding about a soft disclosure um, where they're kind of easing us into the idea. Um, does that play to you or what do you think is happening? I think they're, it's part of the game. They're not telling us the whole truth. They're telling us selected truths. They're telling us convenient truths, just enough to say to us there is a problem and we need more money to build more ships to cope with the problem. What is that problem? Well, the problem is, um, the problem is an imaginary one that they're conning us with, and that is that we have something to fear from the extraterrestrials, when in fact, they are the problem. The cabal that is running the United States and has been for uh, decades and running much of the world uh, has plans for what they call a new world order, uh, which um, sounds like a utopia, but when you get uh, through the, uh, the fog, it is uh, what they intend to do is a world government, unelected, a fascist uh, government uh, of, by, and for them at the expense of all of the rest of the people. And that's what they're having up their sleeves, in my opinion. And uh, so uh, I think their disclosure, and why they would start with something so contemporary instead of going back to the beginning. Uh, well, I, I was going to say I don't know, but I do know because they, they want us to think that uh, all of the, some of this stuff is new and that they haven't known about it for decades and decades before and that they haven't reacted to it already. So I think it's part of the con job. If you could leave people with a single message, a single call to action, what would that be? It would be for the uh, Congress of the United States immediately to set up a committee, bipartisan, to hear witnesses who want to tell the truth and are willing to tell the truth but all they need is an amnesty from the National Security Act because otherwise, if they did that, their lives might be endangered. Their, certainly their pensions would be in danger and they would have other penalties which would prohibit them from telling the truth. And they have to have an environment where they can say exactly what they want to say and exactly what the facts are. And if they do that, then I think the Congress will take the necessary steps to end the problem or to, to mitigate it to the point that the planned New World Order, as it is presently uh, conceived, will not happen.